Reverend Dr. Matthew Kuka, the Catholic Archbishop of Sokoto is online. And um, we welcome you now, um, Lord Bishop, to share with us on your um, perspectives of what can be, what ought to be, and what we need to do to move us to where we really should be. Over to you, Father. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Lagos. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? If you can hear me, please wave your hand because I can I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you. Good. Thank you very much. Um, well, let me first of all say how happy I am to to join you. Uh, I, if things were if things were different, I would definitely have loved to seize any opportunity to be with you. I was very impressed by how clean everywhere looked in the University of Lagos, uh, and I want to commend you very much for that because it's uh, these kind of sites are not things that are very common in Nigerian universities today. Um, well, once again, I thank you very much for inviting me. I. I can only add my voice more by way of wishing you well because uh, you already have an existing institution. So I think there's definitely, we can assume a certain level of clarity about intentions and uh, what you are out to achieve. Um, the, the lady who spoke, uh, whose name I didn't quite get, already made the point and I probably just skip through that because the issue of theorizing, um, has already been done. And I think we've got over 40 or 50 years of political science theories and theoretical formulations across Africa as to what is wrong with the continent, how might the continent develop. And we have a lot of literature, especially given in the heydays of Marxism, when in a bipolar world, um, <clears throat> a good number of our scholars. And I think it's safe to say that social sciences in Nigeria in the 60s and beyond we're literally uh, in, the, in the stranglehold of, of, of Marxist or, or, or socialist scholars. And um, their dominant role in academia has filtered into the Nigerian media. And the result is that we have a frame of social that feeds on that logic. Um, so clearly capitalism has existed in our country only in name. Uh, but the point to be made is that we have had a number of theoretical formulations as to what really were the best ways of Africa moving forward. Um, in the days of, uh, of our bipolar world, um, from the 60s, uh, everybody with the Bandung conference, we had a little bit of clarity of mind about where we were going and whether it is the Nasas of Egypt or the Kwame Nkrumahs of Ghana. Uh, or their Amino Canos or their Wolo Wars of Nigeria and Julius Nyerere, there was definitely a socialist bent uh, and a Marxist bent, uh, perhaps largely because of the, of the, of the people-oriented um, philosophies embedded in these assumptions. But after over 50 years of theorizing, after 50 years of the Cold War, on, well, I don't know whether to say happily or unhappily, communism was said to have ended in 1989. And uh, we seem to have gone back to the bottom of the hill again to ask the basic questions. Uh, what really are the tools that we require to make Africa work? Um, I believe many of us are familiar with the Greek story of Sisyphus. And I've often used this image in talking about Nigeria that we seem to be like Sisyphus. Uh, Sisyphus uh, angered the Greek gods, and for his punishment, he was given a heavy rock, which he had to roll on top a hill. And every time Sisyphus rolled the, 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 the rock, sweating and panting the hill, no sooner does he get very close to the hill than uh, the rock, somehow the gods managed to tilt the rock back. 
he rolled back to the bottom of the hill and Sisyphus had to go back and start all over again. This became literally his life. I've often used this to actually talk about the problems of the African continent in general and Nigeria in particular. Um, the country has been suffused by a high sense of messianism, um, which is why you know, the first generation of uh, those who struggled for independence gave us the impression that they were taking us to an El Dorado. The military interrupted, promising that they had a much better template for developing Africa. Between military rule, flawed elections, dictatorship, tyranny, Africa has been just one huge West uh, land of broken promises, failed ideologies, uh, failed experimentations. And after going and coming, it does seem very clear that no sooner do we think we've started than we all go back to the bottom of the pit all over again. The question then is, has it really been a question of the failure of ideology? Has it been a failure of diagnosis or have the diagnosis been right over the years? Just that we have not had the right pharmacy. Because as you know, uh, Nigeria is one country where, you know, you can actually go to buy a spear part for your car. Uh, to a lesser, to a, later, a lesser extent, even in the pharmacy, where people will ask you, do you want an original or do you want a tokumbo? Um, so we are, you know, the, the fine line between what is original, what is real, and what is imagined, and what is fraud, um, is become very thin. So the result then is that we, are, we, are, we have a total absence of conceptual clarity as to what really is the best way for Africa. And for Nigeria in general. Uh, but again, perhaps we may have been under the illusion that somehow there were some silver bullets somewhere and all we needed to do was to look very well to find them. Or we assumed that there were models in shelves somewhere in Europe and somehow if we only could link up with them, everything will be okay. Um, it reminds me of, the, of a joke about uh, some wealthy Arabs, you know, who found their way to England uh, in the early 40s and 50s. And they went, to a, they went to a shop and they found bathtubs, which they had never seen. Uh, and they found faucets, which they had never seen. And then they also entered the hotel rooms and they found that you simply turn on these faucets and then water started rushing out. And having come from, from the desert, you know, where oases were not so easy to find and water was literally good to them, they were very excited and they said now, they, in whisper, they said, we have found the secret of the white man. And uh, we really don't need to worry. Now we know how these white people get water. So while getting ready to go home, they all decided to count the numbers of families in their communities and so on. And they carried heavy sacks or faucets, you know, back to, back, you know, back to their country. They got home, called out the families and distributed these forces and just said, look, all you need to do is just put them against, against the wall. You turn them on. We no longer have to go to any oasis to find water. We have found the secret of the white man. And um, everybody took the faucet to their homes, just nailed it to the wall. They turned the faucets on and there was no water. They turned the was no water. Well, I'm sure you understand the context of what I'm saying. Um, in the same way, I think we've sent our, 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 our Nigerians and Africans to some of the best institutions in the world, to Harvard, to Princeton, to Yale, to Oxford, to Cambridge, and everywhere, the World Bank, IMF, uh, some of the top banks in Europe and America, and Nigerians have continued to excel in those environments. Yet, Africans come back home, Nigerians come back home, we've had cases of people who uh, left the World Bank to come back to, 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 to be, to head governments in Africa, and they've been almost quite clearly a disaster, except for our daughter Ngozi Iwala, who managed to, to, even at great difficulties, she sailed against the wind, but she held on to those principles. But the point I'm making is that all the training, despite all the manpower, despite all the institutional support and capacity, we have still not come anywhere close to the kind of assumption that we have about ourselves as to what really constitutes development and how close or how far we are. The point therefore for us to make is, and I would like to dwell a little bit on some of the things that have been done. I'm a Catholic priest, so I would also like to, 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 to focus on what I think the church has done over the centuries 
uh, in terms of the areas of development. And perhaps we might find one or two things that will help us to appreciate the fact that it is by collaborating, networking, picking here and there, that we can des design models that might work for us. Because clearly, the fact that, the that all these institutions have worked elsewhere and have failed in Africa should tell us a thing or two. Because central to human development, or to, central to any definition of development, is what happens to the human person. And this has really been at the heart of the way that the church has seen the whole thing about the politics of development. And I speak as a Christian, but also I, I think what I say about Christians will also speak to the issue of what role religion can play. Um, but just to make the point that, you know, uh, conceptually, uh, socialist literatures tended to create the impression that there was an inevitability in terms of conflicts of views between what the church thought and what politics thought and what um, uh, the socialists were thinking. So, for example, but I will, I will make the point that really in, in, in the final analysis, it's not so much what we do for the human person. It is where our inspiration comes from. I think that is what is important. And it is what creates the clear distinction between Marxism and how it saw the human person, humanism, so to say, and then how the church and Christianity has always tended to see the role and place of the human being, person. Uh, because Western liberal models of democracy have tended and, and development have tended to focus on economic prosperity almost as the end goal of, uh, of, of, of development. Uh, and of course, the World Bank continues to present us with indices of human development by which we are also measuring ourselves. But each time we measure ourselves against these existing indices, we realize that we are adopting models that have no real serious relevance to our people because these models have assumptions about already formed Western civilizations and societies. Very often, they don't work among us. This is why up till today, the average politician in Nigeria, the average governor, the average president uh, still is unable to understand how and why, for example, things like corruption uh, are difficult to resolve in Africa. It's not because Africans don't understand the consequences of, cor of corruption. It is that somehow the models of analysis have left us literally bereft of the best solution because we are still seeing those we consider to be criminals and bandits and so on, ennobling themselves. They are also circulating in politics, whether in the, in the National Assembly, whether it's in government houses, whether it's as ministers. And we, even ordinary people, are expecting that those who go to represent us should manifest how relevant they are by the amount of resources that they help to distribute or the amount of development traffic they direct to our people. And this is why you find the average governor saying how many, when, when governors talk in Nigeria, they are focusing on how many roads they have built, you know, how many schools they have built, but there's very little attention being paid to uh, whether a lot of the things they've done have touched the human person. And I think this is where the problem is, namely that, and I've said it severally, that whereas Nigerian governors continue to talk exuberantly about their achievements by measurable indicators, such as the, the kilometers of road they have tied, the, 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 the traffic lights they have installed, even though many of them stop working after a year or so. But by pointing out this visible infrastructure, they forget the fact that, again, infrastructure by itself does not constitute development. It is how this helps us to, um, to become really human and to achieve our God-given destiny, whichever shape or form we define them. It's only then that we can talk about development because at the center of development must be the human person. So in the Bible, Jesus says, I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full. And the Christian text is bearing from the position that a full life, whichever shape of what, you know, whatever that means, um, is the first condition for defining who we are and understanding development. The second point that I make is to borrow from the 1776 Declaration of Independence of the United States of America, you know, in which uh, the framers of that document made, very, made the point very clear that, look, we are committed to the proposition that all men are created equal, you know, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And these among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So essentially, the point I'm making is that development by whatever models or means we discuss must be 
aimed at expanding the space to enable every individual or community pursue what it considers to be happiness. In whichever shape or form, nobody has got, the state doesn't have the power or capacity to decide what constitutes happiness. So, and I, I just draw attention, you know, as I try to end to the way the Catholic Church has dealt with it. In the Catholic Church, we've got the Catholic Catechism, which is a major source of, of, of the church's teachings. And secondly, we've got the Code of Canon, which regulates the activities of the church across uh, you know, society, whether it is with civil society or with the, start, with, 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 with the state itself. It is more or less like the constitution. And then of course, we have the corpus of teachings of what we call the Catholic Church's social teachings. Each of these teaches how a society can uh, be governed or administered. And I, I just want to borrow, let me take from, um, I just mentioned two or three of, uh, of, these, of these encyclicals. The first is the encyclical written in 1891, you know, by Pope Pius XIII, which was published, and it was a, brown, a groundbreaking document because it came about 40 or 50 after the Communist Manifesto. And the Communist Manifesto had talked about the consequences, the corrosive impact of industrialization on the life of ordinary people. But to the extent that the French Revolution and communism tended to see the church as enemy, this document, for example, part of the things the Holy Father said, Pope, the Pope said was, he said, and I quote, workers are not to be treated as slaves. Justice demands that the dignity of human personality must be respected. It is shameful and inhuman, however, to use men as things of gain. The oppressed workers above all ought to be liberated from the savagery of, savagery of greedy men who in, inordinately use human beings as things for gain. Now, the point I'm making here is that we are a building of capitalism focused on economic prosperity and wealth creation and so on. The Pope is arguing and the church is arguing that all of these have to be at the service of the human person. And they must be find a way of helping the human person or helping communities grow. And there was a correlation between the, the producer of labor and the, and, the, and the person who was benefiting from labor. Now, by 1960, Nigeria had become independent. A lot of other African countries and Asian countries became independent. But on the 11th of April, 1963, many of us will remember the, game, you know, the Bay of Pigs, the, the famous drama that nearly brought the world to war. Now, it was about this time that, it was, that, the, that the, the, the crisis around the Bay of Pigs took place. The Holy Father, Pope John, you know, Pope John the 23rd, was very much back seeing negotiations to end this. And when it ended, he wrote an encyclical called Pachem in Terrace, that is peace on earth, on the 11th of April, 1963. And he says, and I quote, every person has the right to life, to bodily integrity, and to the means which are suitable for the proper development of life. These are primarily food, clothing, shelter, rest, medical care, and finally, the necessary social services. Therefore, a human being also has the right to security in cases of sickness, inability to work, widowhood, old age, unemployment, or in any of other cases in which one is deprived of the means of subsistence through no fault of their own. Now, this is very interesting because uh, over, over how many years now? Almost uh, 60 years or 50, almost 60 years later, Nigeria is with the whole question of what to do. You know, so if in 1963, the, the Pope was already talking about things that are embedded in what we now call pension schemes. You can understand that it is from here that the countries of Europe and parts of America began to borrow ideas about how to build a good society. Because the church with the Pope was talking and focusing on the inalienable rights of the ordinary you know, citizens, whether as workers, and that human progress could only happen if the human person was at the center of development. The third encyclical, which I just referred to very quickly, was issued in 1967 and it was called Poplorum Progressio. That is, it was about human progress because at this point, the world is making a lot of progress, but the question is, was progress, well, were human beings also progressing? Were individuals in societies also progressing? And the Pope made the point that the right to security and employment to work for workers, the right to fair and reasonable working conditions, the right to join a labor union, and what is referred to as the universal destination of human resources 
are all fundamental to how a society develops and how a society progresses. The point I'm making really is that um, two things have happened. The first has been the ideological definition of what constituted in, uh, uh, development. And here I make the point that the focus has been on development as we see in infrastructure, but in Europe and America, fundamental principles borrowing largely from, the, from, you know, from the teachings of the church. This, is, this was where the foundation for the social democrats you know, in Europe, I mean, this is where they drew their inspiration. So I'm, I'm making the point therefore that so we took a turn, began to suspect religion, and it is a tragedy that religion has become quote unquote a problem for us in Nigeria. So by way of conclusion, um, the first thing to say is to repeat what I've said, namely that there are no silver bullets out there. Okay, and that indeed the, 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 the church has consistently and persistently focused on the fact that human dignity, human integrity, human well-being, these things are fundamental to how you measure the growth of a society. Well, because we often focus on, on what the country is doing, we talk about Nigeria's oil, but we never talk about the impact of that oil on the lives of ordinary people. And we measure the progress we are making up till today. When you talk to people in government, they are telling us not to talk about how much we are suffering because look, they are building railways for us. They're building, governments always focus on infrastructure that are, which have also become conveyor belts for other forms of corruption, but there's no need for us to go into that. But centrally, the point I'm making, and I like to leave it at that, is that um, without the, a measurable change in the quality of life that ordinary citizens are living, a country cannot claim to be growing, no matter the size of its skyscrapers, no matter the size of its roads, no matter the size of its infrastructure, because what is the use having all these infrastructures and in the final analysis, the, the life of ordinary people does not change. I refer to an anecdote, which I heard from, Wolf, from Wolfenstein, the former governor, I mean, the for, former president of the World Bank, when he visited Nigeria. He said, when he visited Nigeria, some years back before his retirement, that he had a meeting with ordinary people, you know, because he wanted to, he said, we're having this meeting with the minister, with the president, we now needed to hear what ordinary people in Nigeria were thinking and how they saw their development. And interestingly, Wolfenstein said that uh, they brought these this ordinary people from around Abuja. And one of them was an old chief who came, it took him about three, four hours to get into Abuja from one of the rural areas. And when it was time for questions, he said, look, they, he was asking the questions in Hausa and they, you know, what he was framing was being translated to Wolfenstein. And he said, look, I had, to, I had difficulties coming here because I have to cross three rivers before I, get to, I got to Abuja. And each of these rivers we managed to cross because the rains have not, you know, have, have not so high because there are no bridges. We have cried and cried and the government has not provided with, with, you know, with any bridges. He said, but I've arrived at Abuja and I'm looking at Abuja I can see bridges everywhere, but there is no water underneath. Now, what was he seeing? I mean, he had, he, he had just seen all the flyovers in Abuja that had no water underneath. And there that needed water, uh, there were no bridges. And Wolfenstein kept telling this story because he said for him, that was the best definition of the predicament of development in a country. So I'm sorry if I've gone on for too long, but let me try and end by going back to one of our greatest scholars of blessed memory, Claude Aki, who, like Amartya Sen, have interrogated the, the models of development uh, that, be, that became very popular in the world, and came to the conclusion that because Claude Aki actually makes the point that we shouldn't be talking about development in Africa because the project of development never even got off the ground in the first place. And his argument is that the way the colonialists framed development and the way they subsequently framed development so isolated the ordinary person that all he, all he had, his conclusion is that all that was left after the analysis had been done was the predicament of the poor. So I want to just end again by saying that the church, has, the Catholic church, which I represent and which I can speak for with a little bit of authority is to say that we've actually always been there with clear models without a political party of how societies can be organized. Uh, in 2005, for example, Pope Benedict wrote an encyclical. The title of the encyclical was Deus Caritas Est, that is, um, God is love. And he was attacking the, you know, this was around the height of capitalism. Uh, when things were, you know, the, the economy was booming around the world. 
And he said in that encyclical, and I quote, profit is useful if it serves as a means towards an end. Once profit becomes the exclusive goal without the common good as its ultimate end, it risks destroying wealth and creating poverty. The world's wealth is growing in absolute terms, but inequalities are on the increase. This was in 2005. The Holy Father was making, was raising this, 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 this red flag, so to say. The world didn't listen. In 2008, barely two, three years later, the world economy collapsed. So really, apart from ideologies and theoretical formulations, there is also need for a moral uh, compass that can insist that the state focuses not on greed, not on its staying on power, but on the welfare of the common man. Right now, for the diaspora, I cannot by saying that like good poetry, development can be stolen, it can be borrowed, it can be, you know, you know what they say about, about, about poetry. You can beg, you can borrow, or you can steal. Uh, the late uh, Abdul Kadir Khan, he died only, he died last month. But he was the one who gave, who borrowed, who stole, whether he stole or borrowed, more or less he stole technology from the Netherlands uh, and helped his country, India, to build a, you know, a nuclear bomb. Um, I can't make a moral judgment on that, but I make the point that here, the diaspora in Nigeria, the unfortunate thing for us is that it has not been structurally factored into governance. I am convinced that um, unlike other countries, we are diaspora, if you take the Jews, for example, to borrow this concept, the Jews have a principle of return, which means that if you have a drop of blood in you, of, of Jewish blood in you, anywhere you are in the world, you can come back to Israel at any time. You notice that up till today, Nigerians are still fighting about whether those in diaspora can vote or even contest elections. It says where we are. Um, I, my view, for example, is that two things are, are possible. One, unfortunately for us, we are still, the, the diaspora conversation in Nigeria is still largely tied to ethnicity and regionalism. Uh, the project ought to be bigger than that. And the vision has, ought to be bigger than that. The second point is the bureaucratization of the idea of diaspora, by which government literally presents itself as the one to create a bureaucracy. And as you know, everything you create a bureaucracy around um, hardly ever works because government wants to see a mirror image of So my final suggestion is that perhaps Nigerians in diaspora, the office, I mean, in my view, the department or whatever, by whatever name, rather than just seeing it as a commission, it ought to be run by... You know, to be run by either a professor or somebody from one of the highest institutions around the world, so that it can serve as a magnet for attracting the, the, the enthusiasm of Nigerians. And hopefully, beyond developing our communities, our states, and our region, we can focus on the national project of developing our country. I thank you for your patience, and um, may God bless you. Thank you very much for your attention.